Mike, thanks for coming from the Keys. Yep, thank you. All right, guys, big hand for Marshall, big hand for the entire Chaos crew here. Again, I want to remind everybody how hard these guys work to set up these events, obviously to maintain them, and of course to clean up when everybody goes home, putting in a lot of extra time. We really thank all you guys for everything that you do for us. So one more time, big hand for the entire Chaos crew. I mean, where else can you go to for a fishing seminar and just go, hey, bring me a beer, bring me a beer, and have the chance to win great tackle at the end as well. So what a, what a really, really awesome event. Great to be back here, 2023, our first seminar back here at Chaos. A lot of familiar faces. I see a lot of new faces as well. A couple things I want to mention, guys, and then we're going to get right into it because there's a lot that I want to talk about. Again, my name is Captain Mike. Want to remind everybody, the 13th season, our consecutive 13th season of Florida Sport Fishing TV is now airing on the Sportsman Channel across America. Uh, so we're thrilled that we've taken it from Florida to a national level. In addition, our new series, Captain Mike's Rigging Station, is now airing on Bally Sports across Florida. So we have two television series that are airing simultaneously. That's a first for us and a big milestone. We're really happy about that. And you can see all of those episodes first, along with 400 additional instructional videos on our streaming platform, Florida Sport Fishing TV Plus. All I ask from everybody in this room, if you walk out at the end of the night and you feel like you're a better angler and you feel like you're a better Wahoo fisherman and you've picked up some tips, please just join our streaming platform. The web address is fsftv.com. Easy enough, F for Florida, S for sport, F for fishing, TV for television. So say it with me, fsftv.com. Thank you. That's all that I ask. All right, guys, let's get right into it again. A lot that I want to talk about here. Wahoo, absolutely my favorite fish to target. And I enjoy catching everything from bonefish to blue marlin. I've done it all. But there's just something very special about Wahoo, right? We all really love Wahoo. It's such a glamorous fish to catch. You know, everybody's like, oh, you know, what'd you catch? A Wahoo, <laughs> right? A Wahoo. You know, it doesn't matter how big it is. You don't even have to say that. You just have to say Wahoo. And that's all that it takes. And what's really cool about Wahoo, too, you don't need to catch 10 to be a hero or 30 or 50. How many do you need to catch? One. One. Okay, anything above one is a bonus. And when we go out Wahoo fishing, we're literally trying to catch them one at a time. Of course, doubles and multiple fish are super exciting, but we're actually going out there and looking for one fish at a time. Very similar to hunting. That's, you know, I'm not a hunter, but if I was, certainly it would be something very similar. Great fish, okay. When do we target Wahoo? You know, surprisingly, you can target these fish year round. A lot of guys think they're just a wintertime fish, but they're not. They're a wintertime fish because the season peaks in the winter when the water temperature drops, and a lot of the fish up that are summering off the Carolinas move down, and wahoo fishing typically is a wintertime fishery. However, there are wahoo in our waters year round. Just look at a lot of the local tournaments, you know, Jamie's tournaments, the Blue Water Movements. There are Wahoo that are weighed in in July, August, you know, every one of those tournaments. And I'm just using that as an example. So you certainly can go out and target these fish at any time of the year. They're an incredible pelagic species. They're very, very fast growing. A 30-pound Wahoo is about two years old, okay? A 50-pound Wahoo is four to five years old at the most, maybe even less. So they really grow very fast. Not quite as fast as dolphin, but pretty darn close to it. They're always on the move. They're not like a snapper or a grouper that's just sitting in one spot waiting for something to come to it or, you know, uh, focusing on structure. You know, it's not what a wahoo is. A wahoo is a highly migratory pelagic game fish. He is constantly on the move. You know, at night, in the dark, 
He seeks shelter down in the deep, dark water. And in the morning, as dawn approaches, that fish will swim up into shallower water, up the edge. And this is relative if you're right here or down in the Keys where I fish for Wahoo. It's all the same. Okay, the fish behave the same. As dawn approaches, they'll swim up into the shallows for what reason? Food. To food, to eat, okay, for food. And they will eat almost anything that they can catch. Flying fish, squid, goggle eyes, ballyhoo, blue runners, bonitas, juvenile blackfin tuna, small jacks, anything that they Uh, yeah, it kind of sounded like it. Are we back in business? Yeah. Okay. So, again, a lot of that food is in that shallower water. That's why the big Wahoo are not out there hunting on a regular basis in 500 feet. Not to say that they can't catch something. They certainly can. They're one of the fastest fish in the ocean. As a matter of fact, there's only one fish that's faster than a Wahoo. Sailfish. Boom. God, I love you guys. Okay, but short of sailfish, they are just an incredibly fast game fish that can catch anything. Okay, but they know that a large portion of their food sources or a lot of their forage is in that shallower area. Food that's being flushed out of the shallows off patch reefs and off, you know, wrecks and reefs and ledges. So that's why they hunt along that zone. And when I call that a zone, I would say really 100 to 200 feet of water. That's really the key zone for Wahoo. Now up here, when I Wahoo fished up here, the vast majority of our Wahoo were in 130 to 150. Down off the Keys, I find that they're 180 to 190, a little bit deeper down there. But again, in between that 100 to 200 foot is really where you're gonna look for these fish. And understand this, look, my job up here, I've made a commitment to come up here and share with you guys how I Wahoo fish, okay? And not to keep anything from you. So understand you're privileged, you really are, because you're gonna learn a tremendous amount about how I Wahoo fish with nothing held back at all. What you do with that information is completely up to you. Some people may never use anything that I share with you at all. Other people may be running to the counter to buy as much of my stuff as you possibly can. And I hope that you do. Okay. And they all hope that you do, and Marshall hopes that you do. But again, understand I'm not going to keep anything from you. And I also want you to understand that, look, the really cool thing about fishing is everybody does it their own way, right? Everybody's a little bit different. And there's so many different ways to Wahoo fish. We catch Wahoo kite fishing. We catch Wahoo up here. What's the, what's the most popular way to catch Wahoo off this coast is planer fishing, right, with strip baits. But you know what? You're not wahoo fishing. You're not, you're planer fishing. And every now and then a wahoo eats one of those strip baits or a ballyhoo. But so do bonita, blackfin tuna, sailfish, and everything else up here, right? So you, you're not really waking up and going, hey, I'm gonna go wahoo fishing. You may try and convince yourself that you're going to by saying, well, I'm gonna fish bigger strips and I'm gonna have darker color skirts, and I'm gonna kinda lean what I'm doing toward Wahoo, but you can't control what eats that strip bait. I, on the other hand, when I Wahoo fish, I am specifically Wahoo fishing. I do not wanna catch anything else, anything. I don't care what it is, I don't wanna catch it. Because every second that I'm spending reeling in a blackfin tuna or a sailfish or anything else is one second that I'm not fishing for or targeting or reeling in a wahoo, so to speak. So I've designed a system that really works very well for me for specifically targeting wahoo. And that's what I'm gonna share with you. Now also understand, while we talked a little bit here about fishing planers, potentially kite fishing, and even kite fishing, come on. I kite fished up here for decades. When I dangle a, a goggle eye or a pilchard from a kite, and a wahoo comes up and skies on the bait and eats it, was I wahoo fishing while I was kite fishing? No, I was kite fishing and I got lucky and a big old wahoo came up and ate my kite bait and if I was fortunate enough to be fishing wire because there were some kings around, I may have caught that fish, right? But again, I wasn't specifically targeting that wahoo. High speed trolling for wahoo is in fact a great tactic 
that guys utilize to specifically target Wahoo. And it seems like the latest trend, at least that I've been seeing, of high-speed Wahoo fishing is guys that are using these big LPs, right? The big electric reels, and they set up three or four of these on their boat, and they drag these really big lures and heavy trolling leads at incredibly fast speeds of 15 to 18 miles an hour. And they get a fish on, and line's coming off the reel, and they push a button. And it reels into Wahoo. Skips it right across the surface like this. Right? It's right across the surface. And then they gaff it. They throw the fish on the deck. Yes! We got him! You didn't... Well, come on. Come on. Come on, dude. Now, I get it. I understand why people do that. And they'll tell you they do that because the sharks. They'll say, hey, we use these big, fancy, schmancy electric reels because there's so many sharks that if we reel them in, the shark's going to eat them. Well, what happened or what was happening before Lingren Pittman introduced the LP? How did people catch Wahoo? They reeled them in, okay, by hand. So my logic and my goal when I Wahoo fish is I want this to be as sporty as possible. When I hook a fish, I don't want you to fight him out of the rod holder. I want you to pick up that rod, put it under your arm, and I want you to feel the pain. I want your arm to hurt. Okay, I want you to feel the wahoo on the end of the line because that's an incredible experience. It really is to fight an amazing game fish that averages 30 to 60 pounds is your average. Fight them. Don't be a sissy. Don't push a button. Okay, and I get it. Sometimes, you know, the rod's in a rod holder. And I don't complain when I take people wahoo fishing. They say to me, can I reel out of the rod holder? Of course, you know, if that's what you want to do. But that's not what's the intention is. The intention is, is to hook the fish, take the rod out of the rod holder, put it in somebody's hand, and say, stand there and fight that fish. That's fishing. Are you going to get every one of them? No. But you're not going to get every one of them no matter what you do, right? But you're certainly going to enjoy each and every fight. So, I've designed a system, and I don't want to say designed it. You know, maybe that's not a right word. I didn't invent Shimano Tiagras. I didn't invent these amazing Chaos Bempot rods or these lures or any of this stuff. All I did was just take the different pieces and develop the system that works really, really well for me through a tremendous amount of trial and error, weighing out the pros and cons of every single detail. And understand that it's a constant learning experience. A year ago, I was up here talking about Wahoo fishing. Today, I'm going to contradict some of the things that I said a year ago. Why? Because that's the world we live in. That's what fishing is. It constantly evolves, right? Every single trip that you're out there, you learn. You know, these things happen and you're like, oh, shit, I never thought of that. Right? Let me do this. So it's a constant evolution. And what we're going to talk about today is basically a snapshot of where we are today. How do I Wahoo fish today. And I've got a pretty darn good success ratio. Do I catch them every trip? No. Okay. And anybody who tells you that they go wahoo fishing intentionally, that they wake up and say, I'm going to go wahoo fishing, and that they are successful 100% of the time, I'm going to say, bullshit. Okay. They're not. It's an incredible fish that's constantly on the move, and it takes a lot of effort, a lot of commitment, a lot of dedication, and a little luck because there's something that I can't control. I can't put fish in the water that aren't there. All I can do is do my very best to go out, be as effective and as efficient as possible. And if I do that enough times, obviously I'm gonna cross paths with the fish, okay? So, having said that, with a lot of experience wahoo fishing in a variety of different ways, the high speed trolling, catching them on kites, catching them with planers, you know, I now don't do any of those things at all. Okay, and I have found that trolling deep diving plugs, along with some other stuff, and we're gonna talk about some other stuff as well, but a spread of deep diving plugs for me is the most effective way to wahoo fish for a wide variety of reasons. A lot of guys say to me, well, hey, you're down in the Keys, and that works in the Florida Keys. Does your system work here? My answer to you is, you've already answered that question. I'm down in the Keys, and I fish for Wahoo in the Keys. So you're asking me if my system would work right here. I don't know. Why don't you tell me? It does. You, thank you. 
Okay, you know why it does? Because fish eat fish, and wahoo eat fish, and what we're doing is mimicking fish, and wahoo eat those fish, so why wouldn't it work here? The only disadvantage is you have a lot of other bycatch here, right? There's other species that may eat these lures, and not that we don't have that in the Keys, we do as well, um, but I, I seem to think that it may not work as well here, and also there are just simply not as many wahoo here. That's the bottom line. I fished for wahoo up here, I can't tell you, I don't want to say dozens, hundreds of times. The best day wahoo fishing I ever had out here in 20 years of wahoo fishing was three. Three. I've had four, four fish days in the last 60 to 90 days in the Keys alone. Okay, and that's, I'm done by 10 a.m. Okay, we only fish in the morning most of the time. So I know that we have access to a lot more wahoo than you do here. But that's okay, because how many are we trying to catch? One. one. So as long as there's one 50-pounder swimming out there, then we're good, okay? <laughs> then we're happy, because I've said it in so many other seminars on how one fish can change the whole trip. One fish, and as a matter of fact, I have a witness to that right here. This gentleman, this gentleman has been coming to every single one of our seminars, okay? One of my, every single one of my seminars for, I don't even know how many years, literally since day one. He happened to be in the Keys randomly a couple weeks ago. You wanna go Wahoo fishing with me tomorrow? Guess what he said? Hell yeah. Okay, and, ask my wife. <laughs> for, what did what, what you say, ask my wife? <laughs> so, fortunately, we only had one bite. I want to say, unfortunately, we only had one bite, but we caught a fish. And you know what? That changed the whole trip, right? It changed the whole dynamic of the trip, is having a 30, 35, whatever that fish was, you know, having a nice wahoo on the boat. You only need one fish. You really do. So, again, there's no doubt in my mind that this would work here. Everything I'm going to share with you is how I do it, but I, I have to stress, there's no reason it wouldn't work here. I don't think that this is a good approach for the Bahamas because there's too many barracudas in the Bahamas, right? Hot shot, right? Holding that up. <laughs> yeah. There's too many barracudas, so I don't think this is a good technique in the Bahamas. I think the high-speed trolling with the lures and the, and the trolling leads is going to be a better option there. Also understand, though, look, a lot of guys, wintertime, we're going to go wahoo fishing in the Bahamas. Well, whatever port you're coming out of, at minimum, it's a 50-mile run. Am I right? Yep. Minimum, if you're going to Bimini, it's 50, 54 miles, again, depending on where you're coming out from. And if you go to Lukaya and Grand Bahama Island, you could be pushing 100 miles each way. Each way. That's a long way to go. And then you've got all of that fuel. Of course, you've got to pay your entry fees and customs and immigration. And they get you for everything that they can possibly get you for. And certainly you go over there and look, there's no guarantee. If somebody said to me that you can run over to the Bahamas and we guarantee you'll catch 18 Wahoo. <laughs> Let's go. We're going, right? You know it. But you don't know that because it's fishing. So it's a big, big gamble. When I leave my dock, I am wahoo fishing in seven minutes and 32 seconds. Seven minutes, okay? Literally, from the time I get out my pass, I push my throttles down, I'm in the zone in seven minutes. If I don't catch, well, first of all, I don't need to catch 18 because I can't eat that much fish, okay? But if I don't catch one, it's not the end of the world. I didn't make that huge of a commitment, you know, nor do I need to make that huge of a commitment. And Trust me, I'm not deterring you from running over to the Bahamas because most of the guys that run to the islands, they make a weekend out of it, a few days, you're wahoo fishing. In the middle of the day, you might do some deep dropping. You're drinking plenty of that delicious Pilar rum over there. You know, so there's all sorts of other activities that make it an adventure and make it worth it. So I'm not trying to deter you for that. I'm just saying don't think that you have to make that kind of investment or commitment to have exceptional wahoo fishing because you don't. You can do it here. You can do it down in the Keys. We catch wahoo in the Gulf of Mexico. There's wahoo all over the state of Florida, everywhere. So why, why did I turn to the plugs? Well, I wahoo fish or fish alone a lot, okay, because I'm so close to the zone I like to experiment. I like to try new things. I like to develop new patterns. 
I enjoy fishing alone, believe it or not. I like that challenge of going out there and my success or failure is in my hands. And I'll tell you what, you probably hear me scream like a little girl all the way from here when I land fish and I'm by, well, even when people are with me, I scream like a little girl. But especially when I'm by myself because it is such a big achievement to wake up and say, hey, I'm gonna go wahoo fishing on my own, catch you know two, three fish, you can only keep two per person, and come home with two fish before most of you are even out of bed, okay? So I like doing it alone. But when you troll the deep diving plugs, there's a lot of moving parts there, right? And if you're unfamiliar with what we're talking about, we're talking about really heavy tackle, really heavy trolling leads, one pound, two pound, three pounds, upwards of five pounds for a trolling lead. Then you have a 25 to 50 foot shot cord, depending on how you like the rig, okay? And a heavy lure. So when you hook that fish, the boat is still moving at a very high rate of speed. You can't slow the boat down too much because you're afraid of pulling the hook out of the fish because you have a two pound lead dragging that lure out of the fish's mouth. So the boat's still moving really fast. Once you reel that trolling lead to the rod tip, guess what? You can't reel that trolling lead on the reel. Anybody figure out how to do that yet? You can't, right? So at that point, I've got to grab the leader and hand line the remaining way while the boat's moving at a high rate of speed. And by the way, I'm fishing a 39 CV. So there's a lot of things going on and I got to gaff this fish. Yeah, no, nah. uh, you know, I've done it. I've enjoyed it. And I said, there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way. But if the better way is not more effective, then I'm not doing it. Because my goal was not to look for an easier way, it was to look for a better way. Okay, something that was just as, just as effective, if not even more effective, and it's proven to be a lot more effective, but that was more efficient and something that one person can do. And certainly, look, I fish with my wife a lot. The point I'm making is you don't need a team of experienced anglers who have been fishing together hundreds of times or dozens of times to be a successful Wahoo fisherman. You just need the right mentality, the right know-how, the right gear, and you can do it on your own, with your spouse, kids, whatever. Okay, you don't need a giant team. So right out of the gate, the ease of the system was very attractive to me. Deep diving plugs are nothing new. We've all heard of the Rapala X Raps, right? MANS has a series of deep diving plugs. A lot of companies have deep diving plugs and they've been around and they've been catching fish forever. No one, no one makes a deep diving plug like a Nomad. Nobody, okay? This is a very exceptional lure. And understand, it is not perfect and we're gonna talk about that as well. But understand what you're dealing with. This is a Nomad, as you can clearly see, unrigged, unfinished. Okay, this is it right here. It's got a super strong frame. Everything is connected. There's a metal kind of cable in there that's connecting all of these rings all the way to the front. So basically, okay, yes. Point I'm making, it's not perfect. Okay, so even though it's all metal and it's all connected inside, it's not a perfect product. And no matter what, I don't want you to think that if you go and spend 50 bucks, that it's just gonna be a perfect lure, it's gonna swim perfectly, because the biggest problem that I hear from everybody is what? Right, I see people going, it runs off to the right, it doesn't swim properly, and that's, that is a huge problem, and I'm gonna show you why. So, by the way, you know, everybody said you broke, the lip broke. Either way, it broke. So, but again, when this is fished, if you can get it to track properly, it's an unbelievable lure. It's the most effective Wahoo lure that there is. But there are flaws with it, okay? It's not a perfect thing like you just saw. If you put enough pressure on it, it could crack. There are some flaws, not only with this lure, with every lure. But I don't want you to give up because it could be your rigging technique on how you're rigging this. And I stress all of this because every time I bring this up to people and say, hey, I'm really having tremendous success with these nomads, they all, everybody seems to, see, to say the same thing to me. You know, I pulled it, I just couldn't get it to swim right, I didn't catch anything on it. I'm like, well, how long did you pull it for? Oh God, 15 minutes. 
Do you know how long this has been in the water? Hours, hours, okay? So you really have to put in the time. You've got to put in the effort. You've got to make sure that they're rigged right. And regardless of what size, rigging is vital. And I want to show you exactly how we rig these. No cable at all. Do not rig your nomads with cable. Can you rig it with cable? Yes. Is it going to be as effective? No. 220 pound test monofilament. I've tried 200, I've tried 250. Understand that the information that I'm giving you today is not random. It's because of trial and error. I've tried everything and have narrowed it down. 30 inches of 220 pound Mamoy extra hard leader material. It is crimped very cleanly to the front of the lure. You see there's a tiny little loop right there. Leave that loop. If you crimp that tight and there's no give, no freedom, this lure will not swim properly. So that's one issue right there. Make sure that you leave a little bit of loop right there. Clean your crimps, make sure that the end you can see, and when you come up here later, you can take a closer look at these lures. There's no tag end sticking out. There's nothing sticking out of the end. It's very, very clean. 30 inches, crimped again to the top to a 200 pound ball bearing, a diamond ball bearing barrel swivel. Right there, okay? There's no snap, there's nothing else. That is the entire rig, 30 inches. Now, people are going to say, well, wait a minute, with mono, do you get cut off? And the answer is, I don't want to say never, okay, because there's no such thing as never, but I'm going to say very, very rarely, very rarely. Does this get chafed? 100%. After every fish, I'm feeling this. And if it's chafed, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pull another one out of my bucket that's already rigged, okay? I've got a whole bucket of them right there, already rigged. I just pull another one out and I simply tie it on and then back at home, I will cut that and re-rig it, right? Back at home, not on the boat, because guess what? We're burning valuable time. If I have to spend time rigging this lure on the boat, I'm burning valuable time that I should be wahoo fishing. And every second matters. If you are as committed as I am to catching these fish, start looking at all of the very fine details. Not only about the rigging, but how it could save you time and energy by rigging everything off the water. So that is how you rig a Nomad deep diving plug, okay? That is the proper way right there. 30 inches, 220, 200 pounds swivel. That is not how we rig some of the other lures, and we'll explain why in a moment, because there are some that we do fish cable, but for the most part, on all of the deep diving plugs, it's always gonna be mono. You don't need more than 30 inches, okay, because the fish is not going to come up and cut you off up here somewhere. It's not. The reason that you even have 30 inches, remember, you're dragging this through the water, this is the angle right here. This is the angle that this is swimming. So regardless of what direction that wahoo approaches that lure, he's not gonna cut you off up here somewhere, okay? He's only gonna attack the lure from the side or from the back. And understand, when a wahoo sees this in the water, everybody seems to have the impression that wahoo just come racing in at 80 miles an hour, blistering speed, and attack every lure. That's not true. That's not true. At this speed, and we'll talk about proper trolling speeds in a second, Wahoo have plenty of time to inspect the lure. And I've watched every second of underwater Wahoo footage that anybody has ever shot, I've watched it 50 times. Okay, every second watching how they'll come in, they'll see the lure, they'll look at it, they'll back off, they'll come in on this side, and then whoo, they'll fade away. They didn't commit. They saw it, there was something they didn't like, don't know what it was, and they fade away. Other fish, you'll be trolling this, and phew, they do come racing in. And what they're trying to do is cut the bait in half. They're trying to rip off its propulsion. Because if they cut off the tail, now they can turn, come back, and eat the bait. So they're actually trying to sever it. They're not trying to swallow it and attack it and eat the whole thing on the first bite. 
They're literally just trying to wound it, okay? And they do that, you know, their, their mouth is shaped like this, right? Well, they can't cut something with the tip of their mouth. There's no, there's no power at the tip. It's like a pair of scissors. Where's all the power? Right at the hinge. That's why if you inspect a Wahoo's mouth very carefully, you'll see all of the largest, closest teeth are all back here, right in that hinge, because that's where he comes in and whack, and he tries to cut it right in half. So, and with the size of the lure, it's very challenging for him to even get this entire thing in his mouth, which is another reason why we don't need the cable or the wire. And you're just going to get bit a lot more fishing the mono. Okay, keep that in mind. So, the different size lures, you know, even though we have them all rigged the same, when it does come to getting cut off, there is one particular lure or one particular size that. I have found that if you're gonna get cut off, it's gonna be on that one. That's a Nomad DTX 165. And you can see the difference between the 220 and the 165. You can see the size difference. This they can get in their mouth because look how small it is. So just be careful, and I just want to kind of give you a fair warning that these, this size does tend to get cut off a little bit more than this, which barely ever gets cut off. And I think a lot of times people who get cut off on the lure, I don't necessarily think it's because they got cut off. And here, here's what I mean. I had a guy today, I'm on the phone with him and he says, yeah, I pulled Nomads twice, I got cut off twice. I listened to exactly what you said, I rigged them exactly the way you said, I went out, I trolled them, and twice in a row I got cut off. I said, where'd you get cut off on the leader? He said, well, I don't know. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there was no leader left, so he cut me off. And I went, well, did you have your swivel? No. Well, you didn't get cut off, pal. One of your knots failed, right? Premature tackle failure. Either his knot failed somewhere along the line, his braid failed, something failed, but he didn't get cut off. Another, you know, and I, I point that out because these lures get a lot of bad rap from people because they say, oh, they're not swimming properly, they don't track properly. But then I also say a lot of that is user error, just like what this guy is saying to me, that he thought he got cut off, but he didn't. He made a mistake. You know, another guy, if you try and rig this on 300 pound, it probably won't swim right, okay? If you pull this, what speed do you pull this at? Somebody throw something at me. 17 to 18 knots, I heard. Somebody else? Seven to ten. 12 to, 15. Twelve to fifteen. What does the box say? Somebody grab a box right there. Behind the counter, there's a box of nomads. Somebody reach back there. Caleb, right there in that crate. Okay, pull out the big one that says 220. Is that the big one? Let's see what the box says. I think you're all going to be surprised. How fast does it recommend pulling that lure? I'm sorry? No. It says 4 to 12 knots. Rolled between four to 12 knots. There is one speed that you should pull this lure <laughs> if you want to catch fish, if you want to catch Wahoo. There's one speed, it's 10. It's 10 miles an hour, okay? I'm being straight with you. And I want to tell all of you guys something else too. Marshall mentioned it. Nomad is one of my sponsors, okay? so. It's important to me that, of course, you guys all fish nomads, right? And that you buy nomads. But at the same token, what's more important to me is my integrity and that you truly understand what you're getting into. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the best Wahoo lure I've ever come across when it's swimming properly. But to get it to swim properly takes science. Somebody's pulling at 17 to 18 knots. You know what this is doing at 17 to 18 knots? It's flying through the air. 
right? You're never going to get it to swim right. At four knots, you're dragging it through the water. It's not going to have any action. So will you catch fish with these nomads at a variety of speeds? I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Of course, the box says four to 12 knots. Of course you're going to catch fish at various speeds. If you want to catch Wahoo with nomad lures, your speed needs to be 10 miles an hour. You have a little bit of variation, and it could be 10.5, 11, but in that range. That is what you shoot for, okay? 10 miles an hour, period. Now, understand that if I'm going down current versus going into the current, and let's say there's two knots of current, or a knot and a half of current, is my speed still going to be 10 knots? No. no. Because this lure was designed, I don't care what the box says, <laughs> this lure was designed to perform best at 10 miles an hour. When you put too much pressure on the face of this lure, on this massive lip right here, it blows out. It blows out the dynamics, the mechanics of the lure. Whatever went into this 3D CAD design, okay, I, I don't know, but at some point the pressure is so great that the lure blows out, okay? So do not exceed 10 miles an hour, but understand that it's 10 miles an hour against the lure, not boat speed. So if I'm going down current, at 10, 10 and a half miles an hour, and then I turn around, and now I'm going into the current, and I look at my speedometer on the boat, my GPS, whatever, and it immediately drops to 8.5. If I go, oh shit, Mike's at 10, I gotta go faster, right? And you push that throttle up, so now the boat's going 10 miles an hour, how much pressure is on this lure? And be forewarned, it's gonna blow out, potentially, it'll blow out. So right out of the gate, start thinking that the ideal speed, the only speed that you need to pull these out is 10. And that is universal for all of the size nomads that we're going to discuss tonight. And we're gonna discuss the 165, the 180, which you've never even heard about the 180 because Mike is fortunate probably to have the only one in North America at this point, they're prototypes, and the 200 and the 220. So they're all designed to be pulled, or, or let me rephrase that. I don't care what they were designed for. They're all most effective at attracting and catching Wahoo at 10 miles an hour. And you will have the most success at that speed. So that's first and foremost, is remember that. And again, we're talking about everything. We talked about how to rig the lures. We're now talking about speed. Now let's talk about the tackle. Look, I'm pulling a big bait. Big bait, big bait with a big lip, tremendous amount of pressure. I can't get a 20 pound class conventional rod that I would use to feed out a kite bait or light tackle trolling and expect to pull this through the water, could I? No way, okay, no way. It's just putting too much pressure on the tackle. So in my particular case, once again, through trial and error, this is the ideal outfit and you really don't need anything heavier than this by any means. And you can get away with a little bit lighter, but if this is, should be your bullseye. This rod is rated for 60 to 130 pound class. It's called the Chaos Rodzilla. I don't even know if they still make, do you guys still make this exact rod or you've modified it? Does anybody here work at Chaos? Okay, you still make it, okay. So something very similar to this, a bent butt is very important because it keeps the angle of the lure as low as possible. So the bent butt is crucial in this application. The rod is matched to a Shimano Tiagra 30. There are a lot of options with reels. A lot of guys nowadays are turning to the lighter Talica 25s because the drag, it's all about drag, right? If your reel doesn't have a strong enough drag, line is going to constantly creep off the reel. Everybody follow me? So you need a reel that has plenty of drag. The Tiagra does. I don't need a 50 because it's too heavy. So I'm trying to get away with as light as I possibly can without going too light. Because remember, we get a fish on and I'm going grab it, reel them in. 
Okay? I don't want the rod to be so big and so bulky that you can't even lift it up and fight a fish. So this is the right balance. Also understand, while most of the wahoo that we catch are in that 30 to 50 pound range, 30 to 60, that probably makes up 98% of the wahoo. There's that 2% that are 60 to 100 pounds. The monsters, the true, true giants. I want to be ready for those fish. I want to be ready for that one fish of a lifetime. When that 100 pounder eats my lure, which has never happened yet, well, he might have, but I've never seen him. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe I missed him, I don't know. But my biggest to date is just under 70, but my bucket list is that 80 to 100 pound wahoo. I want to be ready for that fish, right? So I need an outfit that can handle an 80 to 100 pound wahoo, which is an incredibly strong fish. But I can't fish a 130 or an 80 wide just for that special occasion because 98% of the bites that I'm going to get are going to be from fish in the 30 to 60 pound range that you can handle on something even much lighter than this. Okay, but because we're fishing these deep diving plugs that create a tremendous amount of drag, we've got to have something that's got some beef. The reel, like I said, very important with the drag to speed makes it a really, really nice benefit. We don't always use the two speed feature, but there are plenty of times when that really comes in handy. So having a two speed reel is a very nice feature. The reason I choose a Tiagras, who likes fishing a gold reel? <laughs> Am I right? When you get down to a boat and you come fish with me and you walk down to my boat, I got eight of these lined up. You feel like a VIP. I'm, I'm being serious. I feel like a VIP. I feel like, whoa, right? I mean, I like fishing those gold reels. So this is one fishery where you could do that because we don't have that option with a lot of the stuff we do. We're not fishing Tiagras or any of the other fancy schmancy gold reels when we're sail fishing or anything like that. You know, we're not. So this is one of those fisheries that allows us to fish this really incredible tackle. So my choice is a Tiagra 30s. This is an LRS, it's called a Long Range Special. That's what that stands for. All that means is it holds a shit ton of line, okay, a lot. Now understand the next vital ingredient to all of this is in fact that line. 65 pound diamond braid, 65. I have fished 50, I have fished 60, I have fished 80, I have fished 100, I've tried it all. 65 is the perfect balance. It is called yard line. If you look on my reel, what color is that line? Orange and blue. Two colors. Two. Not seven. Not one. Two. Orange and blue. Each section is 50 feet. It's very, very simple to remember. I'm a guy who's been fishing since I was four years old. I recently turned 52. So for 40 whatever that number is. I don't even want to talk about it. Okay. For that many years, you would think I would have learned something about fishing and that I don't need colored line to tell me where my lure is. Well, you'd be wrong. Okay. And every single one of you would be wrong if I said to you, please take this, hold that right in your hand, and I want you to stand in the back of my boat, put it in free spool, and let that lure 130 feet. 330 feet. Exactly. 330. How many of you would put that lure at 330 feet? None, okay, none. We'd all be close. Some of us would be closer than others. Some of us might be 320, 390, I don't know. We would all be close. That's not how I wahoo fish. Close is not close enough, okay? It's not. Precision. This is about precision. When I put this bait out, and if I want this bait at 330 feet, all of my outfits are rigged exactly the same. 65 pound diamond braid on the reel. The tip is always blue. So it always starts with the tip of a blue. And understand I fish, or I bring eight outfits. We fish two different trolling spreads, four rods in each of the two spreads. And every single one of the rods is rigged identical. 65 pound diamond braid, with an Alberto knot to 25 or 26 feet of 100 pound 
mono top shot. We connect the braid top shot with an Alberto knot. The 25 feet of mono top shot provides stealth and elasticity, okay, because the braid has no stretch. If I'm pulling this lure, how fast am I pulling this? God, I love you guys. If I'm pulling out at 10 miles an hour and I'm going down sea in a three to five foot sea, which I don't even like wahoo fishing in three to five foot seas, and there's so much pressure on that lure and that drag is really tight and a fish comes up and slams it, if there's no stretch what, whatsoever, what's gonna happen? Zing. Zing pow, exactly. You guys all nailed it. You gotta have some give. And that example might be a little bit extreme, but you have to have some give. So. The 100 pound is imperative. I used to fish 150. A year ago, I would tell you 150. And then I said to myself, I think I can get my lures to penetrate the water column just a little bit more if I lighten up that top shot. But if I go too light, then I potentially will break fish off, which happened to me when I went to 80 pound. So then I settled on 100, and that seems to be the perfect balance. We connected, as I mentioned, with an Alberto knot. Very streamlined, very clean. Okay, the end of that mono top shot is connected to the swivel with an improved clinch knot. Who knows how to tie a fisherman's knot? Whoever didn't raise their hands needs to come to a different seminar called Knot Tying 101. An improved clinch knot, a basic fisherman's knot, okay? It's not crimped to the top. Why? Because I'm fishing, I'm trolling, either my lure is not performing properly or it chafed or I want to switch it for whatever reason. Again, the fastest way for me to do that is to grab a pair of snips, to go snip, to cut this off, grab another one and simply tie it on. Boom. And I'm back in the water in three seconds flat. It's literally that fast. I don't have to fumble around with crimps. I don't have to fumble, because you know what could happen with a crimp too? If you crimp wrong, you could be doing more harm than good, right? And if you're on a rocking boat, shaky hands like I have right out of the gate, you're on a rocking boat, you're excited, you just caught a fish or missed a fish or whatever, it's easy to make a mistake. So eliminate the mistake by just tying an improved clinch knot right there. Very, very simple, and it's incredibly reliable. I caught an 824-pound giant bluefin tuna with an improved clinch knot. I tied the hook on like an idiot, but that's because I had no other option at the time, and it held. And after I caught that fish, I said I will never use any other knot as much as an improved clinch knot because it is that reliable. So very, very simple. That's the whole rig right there. There's no bulky hardware. There's nothing for grass to get caught on other than sometimes you'll get a little bit of grass on here or a little bit of grass on the lure. And I assure you that if you get any grass on there, they're not going to touch it. They're not going to touch it. So anything that we can do to reduce the potential to get fouled by grass or anything that we can do to reduce our entire signature is going to allow that lure to perform better. So regardless of how you're rigging for your, you know, your, your deep diving plugs or how you've rigged in the past, I'm going to tell you through trial and error, and I'm going to drill it into your head that this is the system you should be using. It's proven. Okay? There might be other systems out there that, pro that are proven as well, but I promise you this one is proven. Okay? Now, I mentioned earlier different size lures, and then I also brought up the different color line and why that's so important. We fish a four rod spread. Do you have to fish four rods? No. You're trying to catch one fish at a time, and you can go out there and pull one lure from one rod and get bit. Am I right? The fish can only eat one lure at a time. Although recently somebody told me they had a bite lost the fish, they like got cut off or something, I don't know, and instantly another rod went off, they reeled it up and it had both lures in its mouth. That's never happened to me, and people say to me, if you miss a bite, you know, you get a, you, you reel starts singing, Zzz! and then he lets it go, and then suddenly that rod goes off, is it the same fish? How the hell do I know? I don't know, right? I don't know if it's the same fish. I don't think so, because my logic would be, well, he just grabbed this thing, 
He's got it in his mouth, you know, he's holding on to it, and suddenly it came out, and now another rod goes off instantly. Is it the same one? I, I, I wish I knew that answer, you know what I mean? Also, sometimes people say, well, how do you miss a bite? Remember what I said earlier, the Wahoo comes in and he's trying to, he grabs it and he cinches down real, real tight. He's trying to literally cut that in half. So he grabs the lure at whatever angle, maybe it comes in from the side, maybe it comes in from the front, maybe it comes in from the back and he grabs it. He's holding on to it. I mean, of course, he's cinching down all of that pressure in his mouth. So the lure is not sliding in his mouth. That hook doesn't catch him, right? He's just holding it. He's lucky that he grabbed it at that particular angle. And then just as he opens his mouth or eases off, the lure goes whoop and flies out of his mouth because he never had that hook in his mouth. That's what a short bite is. That's what a short strike is. He never, of course, had that hook. Now, I point that out because there's another factor about these lures. When I said to you that they're not perfect, Okay, there's another, and I don't want to call it flaw, I'm going to call it modification. These hooks. This is right out of the box, and these lures are rigged with these hooks. They're BKK or something like that. Yeah, I think they're called BKK hooks. I believe they use these overseas in Australia a lot. Look at the angle. I'm not sure if you could all see that, okay? But I want to kind of stress the angle of that hook. It goes like this. It arches in like this. Okay, see that there? It arches in. When I started fishing these plugs, rigged just like this out of the box, I would say easily, easily, I would miss four out of ten bites. Easily. And then out of the remaining six, I would lose at least, at least another 20 to 40 percent. So when you calculate it all, maybe 50-50 shot, maybe. When a fish grabbed that lure, did I actually land that fish? And it was probably a little bit less than 50. Well, that doesn't work for me. I don't know if that works for you, but that don't work for me. You know, putting in all that time, energy, effort to go out there and find and fool these amazing game fish, and you finally get a bite. Reel starts singing, and he's gone, and you miss him. And again, if it happens every now and then, that's okay, because it's fishing. It happens every now and then. But when it happens so much, there's a flaw. There's a flaw. And the flaw is, is the shape of the wahoo's mouth. Like I said, it's like a V, right? If you look at it, it's like a V. When he grabs it, look where that hook point is. It's pointing down. It's over here. You know, and it's kind of hard to see, obviously, but he can't get hooked. And a lot of them just don't get hooked from the shape of that hook. So I went on a mission to find the right hook. 13 hooks later, Okay, I'm going to tell you the right hook, and if it's as important to you as it is to me, you may want to write this down. It is a VMC inline southern tuna hook. The number of the hook is 8700, 8700, and that is a 90 hook. Look at the shape of that hook. Okay, if everybody can see it, that hook point is straight. Wahoo grabs it, lights out, pal. You're coming home for dinner. Okay, my success ratio soared, soared dramatically by just switching hooks. Very, very important. However, these hooks that the lure comes with, you can see the eye of the hook only requires one split ring because of the orientation of the eye of the hook. Well, this VMC, they don't make the eye of the hook in that orientation, so I needed to add a second split ring in order to get that hook to lay in the correct orientation. If I didn't add the second split ring, the hook would be sideways like this. And if the hook is sideways like that, what's going to happen to the lure? It's not going to track properly. Okay, so you have to get the hook in the correct orientation. It almost acts like a keel, like a rudder, okay, like a fin. Okay, it has to be in the right orientation when you're putting so much pressure on these lures, pulling them at high rates of speed. So 
make sure that, again, that you're putting them in the correct orientation. Also, if you replace the hooks, you see how this back hook is facing up? Make sure that that's facing up and not down. Otherwise, you can take a lure, I'll just use this as an example. If you put this bottom hook on incorrectly, it's gonna be riding like that. Are you gonna hook a wahoo with that hook like that? You can't because the lure is in the way. So the hook has to be pointing down. So if you're going to replace the hooks, which I highly recommend, I'm sorry, Nomad, don't get pissed off at me, but I highly recommend it. Do it the right way and make sure that the hook lays in the right orientation, okay? And again, that's a size 9.0. I know you have a question, save it for the end, okay? And we'll talk about it back then. One other thing to mention, when you are dragging this lure, this hook, I want you to imagine that multiplied by probably 10 times, 10 times. That's how fast this lure is vibrating in the water for three hours. The metal on the back of the lure is stronger than the metal on the split ring. And what happens? It wears away your split ring. And you're fishing, and I learned this the hard way. I'm trolling, I get a bite, zzz, gone. What? Wait a minute. What happened? I don't miss fish anymore. I got the right hooks. I reel it up. The hook is gone. And the rings. And the guy looked at me and goes, how'd that happen? And I went, well, I don't know. I really don't. This is one of those things that just happens. And because sometimes things just happen right in fishing. You never know. Well, the very next day, different lure, exact same scenario. So I felt like I had to figure out what it was. And I started to really inspect everything in detail and realize that that wears away the ring. So after about three to five hours of trolling, you should replace that split ring. It's a 300 pound split ring. It does not take a lot of effort. It probably costs about four cents as compared to a $50 lure and the fuel in the boat and everything else, the four cents is insignificant, isn't it? And if it takes you a little bit of time to do that, well, you know what, that's what it should take you and that's fine because you're targeting this amazing game fish that doesn't come easy. Anybody can go out there and catch a wahoo here and there, a blind squirrel can find a nut, right, every now and then. But to do it consistently, you should earn it. These fish make you earn it, and you should. You should have to do all of these things to really be consistently successful. Doesn't bother me, I enjoy it. I enjoy all of the time off the water, getting ready and, you know, and preparing for the time spent on the water okay, in order to be successful. So those are a few of the details about these lures that you need to be aware of prior to us even talking about how we set the spread that will help you fish these more effectively. As far as color is concerned, they eat them all. They eat them all. The color is a matter of preference. If I had to pick one, I'm gonna say silver green mackerel. This is what they call silver green mackerel. It is hot, but that's because I fish it a lot, a lot. Right, because if you catch a fish on a lure, you're like, I want to fish that same lure. So the more you fish that same lure, the more fish you're going to catch on it. But that doesn't mean it's a better color. It means it's in the water for a greater period of time. So of course, you're going to catch more fish on it. They eat them all. I like the pinks. I like the blacks. Some of them, you tell me what in the hell that looks like. What is that? Have you seen a bait fish that looks like that? They eat it. I've caught them on this. How about, oh, I mean, it goes on and on. This gets, what is this? What is this? This is like something from a tropical aquarium, okay? They eat it. They eat it, it's swimming. Remember, it's about contrast. It's about shade, okay? They don't see this the way that you and I see this. The Wahoo's not looking at it going, Shit, look at that pink color lure, right? He's not saying that at all, okay? He just sees the thing swimming. And yeah, he may hit it or he may not hit it. 
and maybe color has something to do with it, but we're not smart enough as people. We're not. We don't have the equipment, the knowledge, or the know-how to know that Wahoo is thinking at that very moment when he commits or does not commit. We don't know why he decided I am absolutely going to attack that and eat it because of it's the right color or he fades off and doesn't eat it because it was the wrong color. We don't know that. There's no way for us to know that. So is it a good idea to have different colors? Absolutely. You know, I've tried and I tried to get this dialed in. You know what I thought? The sun, the sun. The closer the lure is to the surface, well, let me, let me back up. The closer a bait fish is to the surface, the brighter it's gonna be. The deeper in the water column that a bait fish is, the darker it's gonna be. So I went, okay, let me fish bright lures up on top and darker lures down deep. Well, that didn't prove, you know, there was no pattern or nothing emerged to say that that was right. And then I thought, okay, let me keep it natural. What does that look like? Mackerel. Looks like a, you know, a bonita or a mackerel, right? Whatever, that's really what that looks like. So I'm like, let me keep it natural. And it worked, I, I catch fish on it. But then I catch just as many fish on some shit like this. What is that? Nothing, okay? But to you and me, it's nothing. It could look like a bonita, right? It could look, a bonitas have the spots on the side, so maybe it's a bonita. Maybe it's some crazy yellowtail or some kind of reef fish that made its way out into the deep and it's lost and now it's dead meat, you know, and they see it. I don't know. So again, I have to stress that while there's a lot of different colors, we catch them on all of the colors and I do not base my spread on color of lure. If that lure is swimming properly in that position, I'm fishing it. I'm fishing it until it gets eaten, okay? I'm going to fish it. I'm not going to switch it. If I don't get bit, I'm not going to go, well, we didn't get bit because we weren't fishing the right colors. Everything looked right. Water was right. There was bait. Everything was perfect, but we didn't get a bite. Well, that's because we weren't fishing the right colors. No. So I like to mix it up. I do have some darks. I do have some lights in the pattern, but I don't do it consciously. It's just because I have a whole variety of lures and I just randomly pick them out. No pattern has emerged whatsoever. And I am certain that if you pull this right here with no paint on it at all, you will get, you'll get bit. It prob you'll probably get bit on this more than any of those because it just looks like, who knows, it's silvery like a flying fish. So don't think about color. So here we are. We've now, we're rigged, we're ready to go. We've got our, our lures and it's now time to go wahoo fishing. It's bright and early. I like to go early because studies have proven, tagging studies have proven by 9 a.m., 10 a.m., wahoo are down deep. And there's not a lot of tagging studies. Anybody want to know why? Who in the hell wants to tag a 50 pound wahoo and let him go? I would tag him with my gaff and let him go into my box, right? Nobody lets wahoo go. So there's not nowhere near as much data on Wahoo as there is on dolphin because so many people release small dolphin, you know, or even billfish. There's just a little bit of data. But all of that data has proven that by 9, 10 a.m., Wahoo are going darker, deeper, and are just not on the edge anymore as much as they were early in the day. And it makes perfect sense because they're ambush predators, they're fast, they have a dark color back, silver belly, they blend right into the environment, they have these amazing stripes on their side, you know, some people call them zebras of the sea, and you've heard all of these names, cheetahs of the sea, they blend right into the environment, they come up there in the shallows, they see whatever, they chase it, they eat it, makes perfect sense, right? So early in the day is great, plus less boat pressure early on. I'm usually home before most guys, especially in the Keys, because let me tell you something, in the Keys, it seems like people don't go fishing until 10, okay? They're rolling out at 10. They're like, hi, uh, you know, I'm going home, okay? And they're rolling out at 10. So earlier is always better. In addition, 
And anybody, anybody who here who's really an experienced Wahoo fisherman has to agree with me, has to. 95 plus percent of all of the Wahoo we catch are empty, empty. There's not a single thing in their belly. You catch a blackfin, he's full, and he's still eating. You catch a dolphin, they're full. We find all kinds of crazy stuff inside these fish, right? We're always inspecting their stomach contents. It's like a science experiment. And there's all sorts of stuff inside these fish. Not in Wahoo. 98% are empty. One out of every maybe 30, 40 fish has something in it. Maybe a flying fish, maybe a, who knows, you know, some kind of bait fish deteriorating. So I always thought to myself, well, how long does it take for a wahoo to eat a bony fish, something like a small bonita or a jack, and for that meal to completely dissolve, bone and all, to completely dissolve in that fish's stomach. And everybody that I've talked to that seems to know anything about digestive systems and the medical field, they all tell me minimum 24 hours, minimum, that you would find some residue of its last meal 24 hours later. So if they're all empty, that means that that fish was looking for its breakfast, right? And we caught him when he was looking for his breakfast, because if he ate breakfast, boop, he's gone. He's gone. He's not going to continue to feed. Otherwise, a lot more of the fish that we catch would have something in their stomach. That proves the point on why it's another good idea to go as early as possible, okay? because you're trying to catch those fish before they find their breakfast. Another benefit is if you don't catch the wahoo, you could do something else. You don't have to just go wahoo fishing. If it, you, know, you can give it a couple hours, if you don't catch them, then you can go off and go dolphin fishing or snapper fishing or kite fishing or whatever else it is that you want to do, your plan B, etc. Now, when I go wahoo fishing, I don't bring any other rods on the boat, nothing. You know why? It's too easy, too easy by 9 a.m. to go, oh, I didn't get a Wahoo bite. All right, skip it. Let's go do something else. Well, I can't go do something else if I don't have anything else to do. If the only rods on the boat are my Wahoo rods, I got one option. I'm Wahoo fishing. That's what I'm doing, no matter what. And no matter what challenges that I face, I have to figure out how to overcome those challenges. What do I mean by challenges? What are some of the challenges that we face when we're Wahoo trolling? with this kind of spread, what's our biggest problem? Grass. 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 Grass is our biggest problem. If there's too much grass and you're constantly getting fouled up, it really makes trolling this spread very challenging, okay? And our only option sometimes is to pick up and move, not to switch gears and say, okay, well, I'm going to go Something else, no, it's I'm going to go to a different area and see if I can get away from the grass. Maybe there's some sort of loop current and that's what, or an eddy off of a current and that's what's bringing the grass right there. There's a lot of different potential scenarios on why sargasm may be in one area or eelgrass and not in another area. So, you know, it forces us to look elsewhere. Now, understand one thing you can do when there is a lot of grass is you could fish live bait. Okay, you can slow troll with live bait. I don't like to catch wahoo on live bait. Why? Because I seem to try and find the hardest way to do everything. Okay, the most challenging way. I would rather catch a wahoo, a 50 pound wahoo on that than any other way. To me, it's just that challenge. It's the challenge of fooling this amazing game fish on an artificial lure. Could I catch them on live bait? I know I can. I can slow troll blue runners all day till my, you know, I'm blue in the face and get bit. I'm not saying I'm going to get bit all day, but I'm saying that's a great way to catch Wahoo. I just don't want to do that. That's just my personal preference. Doesn't mean that's your preference. You can do that. You know, the evolution of a fisherman, right, is at first you want to catch as many fish as you can when you first start fishing. That's what everybody says to me. I just moved down to Florida. Man, I just want to catch anything so my wife doesn't kill me. All right, so my kids stop making fun of me. How do I catch anything? Go out here and put a couple planers out with some strip baits. Okay, you'll be a hero before you know it because, of course, you're fishing for anything. 
But then as a fisherman evolves, it's I want to catch certain fish, certain way. And then eventually you reach a point where you're like, I want to go out and only catch Wahoo. And I only want to catch him with artificial lures. And I only want to catch him on DTX plugs. And I only want to catch him. And you keep, you know, shortening it or making it tougher and tougher and tougher. But then when you do, and I want to do it by myself, okay? And then when you do it, the reward is just that much greater. You know, it really is. So that's just kind of like my mentality. It doesn't have to be yours, but again, that's my mentality. So back to the grass. That's one of the biggest challenges we face. And there are times we can't get away from it, especially, especially in the spring and summer. That's why you don't hear so much about Wahoo caught in the spring and summer. We have prevailing southeast winds. You get a lot of grass. Okay, and, and what's everybody doing in the summer? Thank you. Nobody wants to deal with the grass on the edge trying to wahoo fish when they're all saying, hey, I'll do that in the winter time. Let me go offshore and go dolphin fishing because it's peak dolphin season. So that's why we don't hear a lot about wahoo, one of the reasons during those times of the year. But yes, grass is one of the biggest issues that we have. We do the best that we can to avoid it, but there are times there's absolutely nothing you can do. And if you find that every two minutes you've got to clear the spread and get grass off of this and you can't get away from it, pack it up and go home. Go home because remember, you don't have any other rods on the boat and you don't want to sit there and deal with that all day long. So just call it a learning experience because we can't control mother nature. There are things that we can control. I can control the boat. I can control the tackle. I can control a four cent split ring. I can't control grass. I can't control green water. Wahoo don't like green water. Wahoo like clean, clear, blue, oceanic water. It's like a tuna, or it's like a billfish, or a dolphin. It's a highly migratory pelagic. It's not a king mackerel. You can catch king mackerel in pea soup, okay? They like that green stuff, am I right? Not wahoo, they don't, okay? So they don't like green water. That's something that often we have to deal with. As a matter of fact, last September, September 2022, I wahoo fished 13 times and caught none, none. I had a stretch of 13 trips. I didn't tell many people this, because of course you don't go on Instagram and go, nope, didn't get them again. Okay, oh, time number eight, still zero. Okay, didn't tell people that. But we had green water, nothing every day, every day it was really, really green and a lot of grass. And then we had that hurricane. And of course, there's no good side to a hurricane, except it pushed all of that water out and nice clean water moved in and boom, the fishery blew wide open. Okay, so there are things that we just can't control, but we have to control what we can. So it's early morning. I'm getting ready to go. I like to leave at least my dock this time of the year. I generally depart at around 6.20 or 6.30. This way when I get to the edge and I'm ready to start fishing, it's before 7. Okay, a little bit of light out there. Plenty of light for the fish. You can even troll for these things in the pitch black and you'll catch them. But I don't recommend that because certainly off the keys, not only are we looking for the color of the water and any the presence of bait fish and grass, but we also have a lot of buoys out there. Crab trap buoys, lobster trap buoys, and you don't want to deal with that in, in the dark. You don't want to deal with that in the light, let alone in the dark. So usually we'll start fishing just before seven. I'll get to where I'm going, which is that edge between 130 and 180 feet, you know, like we talked about. And for me, I have the most success in or around 180 feet. Okay, sometimes a little shallower, sometimes a little bit deeper, but I spend the majority of my time focusing on 180. That's my avenue, so to speak, okay? I am not one of these guys that does these huge zigzag patterns all the way into 90 and then zigzagging out to 250 and back and forth. No, that's not me. I like to, to troll as straight as possible with just a little loose S, very loose S, staying in that zone that's as effective for me as any other depth of water. But as I mentioned up here, it could be shallower. Up here, I had the most success in 130 to 150. Down there, as I mentioned earlier, it's more 180. When I go out wahoo fishing, I am not looking for wahoo, okay? 
Don't misunderstand me. Do I want to catch Wahoo? Yes. Am I targeting Wahoo? Yes. When I say I'm not looking for Wahoo, I'm not going out there and looking in binoculars for Wahoo. I'm not looking on my Furuno TZ touch on the screen waiting to see schools of Wahoo. I'm not doing that at all. I'm simply looking for the combination of the right depth, the right water clarity, the right structure, and hopefully the presence of bait fish. And if I can couple and combine all of those things together, and if I can set an effective spread and everything is swimming and working properly, I'll, I can almost guarantee you we're gonna get bit. It's just a matter of time and we're gonna get bit if you can put all of those pieces together. So I play a game of connect the dots. I have a lot of wrecks that I fish in that 170 to 200 foot range. And I know a lot of the bait fish that Wahoo feed on relate to those wrecks, right? The jacks, the blue runners, bonitas, bullets, all sorts of stuff. So I simply look at my chart plotter and I go from this wreck to that wreck, to that wreck, to that wreck, and I just connect the dots. And fortunately, they're all within that zone. These are all the mutton spots that we generally fish, okay? And like I said, either on top of the wreck or in between the wrecks is where we'll generally get bit. You don't have that exact option here. I know that because I fished here for so many years. You go out of Hillsborough Inlet, you have a small cluster of wrecks just to the southeast of the inlet that everybody and their mother is fishing. Snorkelers, divers, uh, kayakers, everybody. Anybody that's anybody out on the water is fishing that little cluster of wrecks, the guy Harvey and whatever those are. You have a couple of wrecks up off of Boca, okay, up there. What's that one that's real, real popular? The Hydro, right? You have four wrecks that are pretty good wrecks just north of uh, Port Everglades. So you just don't have the same type bottom in the same scenario that we have in the Florida Keys because of course we have a natural reef system one of the largest barrier reefs in the world and it's healthy you have <laughs> you have the stinkhole the stinkhole okay you have freighters with chains on the bottom of the ocean that are absolutely destroying the bottom you have sewer lines that are pumping raw sewage into the ocean by the millions of gallons every day. This is still happening right here every day. Hence the stinkhole, okay? It's happening. So you don't have the same environment that we have and you don't have that same ability to connect those dots. But you do have enough structure where you can focus on the structure because remember, it's all in the details. Not only the details of the lures and how they're rigged and the tackle that we're fishing, but where you're fishing. So many people go out there and they get on the boat with me and I say, what do you see around you? And they look around and they go, I see a lot of water, Mike. And it all looks the same, right? Because it's just water everywhere. Stop looking at one dimension. Start thinking three dimensions. Start thinking, what's the bottom like? Okay, what is the bottom like? Where are the slopes? Where's the structure? Where's the reefs? Where's the wrecks? Anything. What is that bottom? And how do you learn that? Well, time on the water, studying charts, and there's a tool out there nowadays called Seymour, okay? Which has opened up a whole new world to anglers. It gives you that picture of the bottom. Study it, use all of these tools. The better you understand your target, your quarry, the more successful you're gonna be hunting that particular fish, there's no question. So don't just look at everything as if it's flat. So I know when I leave early and I get to the edge, immediately I'm not thinking flat, I'm thinking where are the wrecks in relation to where I am, what edges am I gonna troll, and understand I'm a creature of habit. I fish a 26 to 30 mile stretch, never more, never less. Meaning I, when I come out of my pass, Sister Creek in Marathon, I'm either fishing 12 to 15 miles this way or 12 to 15 miles this way. That's my zone right there. That's where I catch all my Wahoo. I do not Wahoo fish outside that zone ever. I know that zone like the back of my hand. 
I know every nook and cranny. And I will fish it, not, not the whole zone, I'll pick sections. And I'll fish that section, I'll go back and forth because I know that it's just a matter of time that I'm gonna cross paths with that Wahoo in that zone. I've caught dozens in this small little stretch, so it might only be seven miles wide on this particular day. I'll go back and forth. I'll go back and forth on the same line even, okay, where other people are like, oh, well, they make one pass, we didn't catch them, let's keep going. No, if the conditions are right, in that one little zone, I'm gonna keep pounding it and pounding it and pounding it and pounding it over and over and over until we connect. Some days it's easier than other days. Area and learn it really well. And if you're fishing out of hills, bro, I tell you, don't go toward the freighters, you know? And if you do, try and hit those wrecks that are just north of Port Everglades, but I wouldn't go any further than that. You know, that just really isn't a big Wahoo zone. Most of the Wahoo that are caught in this area are certainly gonna be from Hillsborough Inlet up to like Palm Beach, you know, Delray, things like that. This is a great area. You've got a great 10 mile stretch. Well, I don't, I don't wanna say great, a productive 10 mile stretch where a ton of Wahoo are caught every year. Remember the charter boats, the Bolo, and all these other guys that go out here every day, two, three trips a day, planers, these guys catch a lot of Wahoo, a lot. But of course, they're out there, two trips a day, every day. If you spent eight hours a day pulling baits out here every single day, you're gonna catch a lot of Wahoo too. And understand it's a numbers game. I'm the same way, I fish a lot for the Wahoo. We do Wahoo fishing courses where guys come with me and we spend six hours doing nothing but Wahoo fishing. And if I don't have a course scheduled, I'm fishing anyway. If the conditions are ideal, it's because I love it. I'm not taking people to Wahoo fish because they want me to take them. I'm taking people to Wahoo fish because I'm going if you're coming or not. Okay, I'm going. So if you want to come along, great. Okay, I enjoy it that much and I'm always learning and always putting in the time. But remember, it takes time. You've got to invest that time. So let's get on to this because there's still a lot that I want to discuss with you guys. So I get out there, I'm on the edge. The first thing that I'm going to do is put, is I'm going to stop the boat. As soon as I get to the edge, 180 feet of water, stop, neutral. I'm going to get my rods ready. They're already rigged. I'm going to put them in position and I'm gonna just stop for a minute, I'm gonna look at my chart plotter, and I'm gonna look at the current. What direction is the current moving in, and how fast is the current moving? That's gonna help me determine, do I wanna go east, or do I wanna go west? Because remember, off the Keys, we don't fish north and south for Wahoo. We fish east and west because of the orientation of the land. Here you're fishing north and south. So I have to make a call and say, do I want to go east or west? And both are equally as productive for me. So sometimes it's just flipping a coin. Sometimes it's saying, well, let me start in one direction and then let's see what happens. And I can always play it by ear because ultimately I'm going to have to turn around anyway. How fast am I moving? Ten. Ten. So within an hour, I'm making a U-turn no matter what. Okay, within an hour. And when people say to me, do you find that you catch more going down current or into the current or east or west? I'm going to tell you, I catch them both directions no matter what. Not all of the time, but I'm pointing out that no pattern has emerged where I could say, I absolutely catch more going east. If that was the case, I would troll 20 miles to the east. Okay, reel everything up fly back up to the start line, and then go east again for 20 miles, right? Doesn't make a lot of sense. You've got to turn around no matter what. So we catch them in both directions. Once I've determined exactly the speed and the direction of the current, and I have an understanding as to what I'm dealing with, and it's relatively calm, because I'm going to tell you we have the most success when it's calm. Why? Boat, rods. Don't look at it as two separate things. Look at everything as one cohesive unit. When I let these lures out, they're way back there, the lures are connected to the rods, right? The rods are in rod holders connected to the boat. So everything is moving like this, one cohesive unit. When I push the throttles on the boat, the lures move at the same speed as the boat. Makes sense. When it's calm, 
everything is working together universally. Everything is one smooth, cohesive unit. When it's rough, you get this. Okay, lures are coming up, they're surging, they're coming down waves, the boat's going up a wave. All sorts of different mechanics are entering the equation that are not natural. So we do not have anywhere near as much success when it's anything above three foot, okay? One to three foot, one to two foot is really ideal, where everything is just smooth and consistent. If that speed is constantly fluctuating, you know, 10.4, 10.8, 11.2, because now I'm coming down a wave, right? 11.8, and then you come back up a wave and it drops to 9.8, and things are constantly fluctuating, you're not gonna have anywhere near as much success as if you can just stay steady, steady. So there are days when I can tell you there is a difference that we see in the bites, down current or up current, depending on the conditions. Because if it's choppy and you're going downhill with the sea behind you, you're fluctuating a lot, right? You're going down a wave, up a wave, down a wave. So a lot of things are changing. If I turn the boat and, went in, and go into it, everything stays the same as far as speed is concerned. On those days, going into it is gonna produce more than going downhill. Plus, when you're going downhill, you get a lot of this. Right, when you come down a wave. And then you say to somebody, hey, just push that up just a little bit, and they go. <laughs> they lock it up. You know, you're like, oh, just, fat, just, a, just a smidgen, just push it up. My smidgen and your smidgen evidently aren't the same smidgen, okay? My smidgen is a hair. Your smidgen is two inches on the drag. And then I go back there to check the drag and it's completely locked, solid. Solid, locked. You're gonna lose every fish. Every time a fish comes up and smacks one of the lures, there's no give, you're gonna break them. You're gonna bust them off. Something has to give. You're not gonna take a 50 pound wahoo. He's not gonna come up, grab the lure, and you're just gonna drag them, okay? It's not gonna happen, something is gonna give. So you're always going to have, like I said, more success when you can keep things consistent. So here I am, it's now time to set my spread. Doesn't matter if I'm on the boat alone, fortunately I have a great autopilot, okay? And I'll just hit auto if there's someone else on the boat. I'm not recommending that you do this on your own, I'm just simply pointing out to you that the scenario is the same. Either someone's standing at the wheel looking or they're not, but the boat's an autopilot. I've already adjusted my speed, and now the boat, before I put a single bait in the water, the boat's moving at what speed? 10 miles an hour. I now take my smallest lure, okay? Smallest in size with the smallest lip. Remember what I said to you earlier that this is a DTX 180. Now, you may find this fascinating, because I did at first, and it took me a minute to figure it out. You can take this DTX 180 with that size lip right there, and you can pull this lure, which I have, at 17 knots. And it will swim and track properly at 17 knots. That's what this was designed for. That's why I said to you it's a prototype. But you can only pull this at 10. Well, how in the heck can I pull this almost twice as fast as this? because logic says to me that I should be able to pull this much faster than this. Somebody tell me why. Smaller, less drag, smaller lip. So less pressure on this lip because it's smaller. So I can pull it much faster. But by pulling it much faster, what's the downside? It's shallower. So you're not this at the same depth as this at the same speed. Okay. Pull it faster, but shallower. So, my first bait, first bait is going to be my furthest bait that swims the shallowest. 330 feet. How many sections of line is that? 22. 22, he said. Have another beer. Okay. Six. Right, six sections, because every section is 50 feet, and then I have 
25 feet of top shot and approximately four feet of leader. So, 30, 330 feet. I could say to you, please let this out, 330 feet. I can walk away, completely walk away. I could come back and go, where is it? And who can look at me and go 330 feet? And guess where that lure is gonna be? 330 feet, because he was able to count to six. <laughs> it's a no-brainer, people, okay? And I'm telling you that this is vital for effective wahoo trolling with this spread when you're fishing multiple lures. Because when I tell you, you do not want to get all four of these tangled. You do not want to get all four of these tangled. Has that ever, anybody ever go trolling and get their lines tangled? Whoever's not raising their hand is full of shit, sorry. We've all gotten lures tangled, right? It happens. So when we're wahoo fishing, every second that we're untangling is one second we're not fishing. It's one second we're not catching. So my system eliminates that altogether. It is precise and it is perfect and it's simple, but it's deadly effective. And you always want to set your furthest, shallowest bait first, always. Why would I set a close bait and then a far bait because it has to pass that bait? Everybody follow me? I don't ever want to do that. So the very first thing I'm going to do is set this out. I'm going to get it out. Want blue, orange, blue, orange, blue, orange. Boop, locked up. I'm at 330 feet. And I want to point out, Whenever you put these DTX minnows in the water, be sure you're in free spool with the clicker on, okay? Free spool with the clicker on. I cannot stress that enough. If you do not, because remember, the boat's already up to speed. The boat's already moving 10 miles an hour. If you put this lure in the water at 10 miles an hour and you're not in free spool, it's gonna come back and hit you in the forehead and that hook is gonna poke you in the eye. And obviously, we don't want that, because then I gotta take you home. Actually, I'm not gonna take you home. I'm gonna cut the hook out and keep fishing. And I'm gonna tape it to your face, okay? So make sure you're in free spool with the clicker on when you put that lure in the water. Feed it back, get it out 330 feet. There's a safety tether, which by the way, the number one safety tether is called a big game leash. That's not what this is about, but I want you to look that up, the big game leash. Anyhow. I push up the drag, I check the drag. I could adjust the drag perfectly because the boat's already moving at the right speed. I don't need to come back and readjust the drag. Not initially, I need to check it, but initially I could set it based on the boat moving at 10 miles an hour. Now, I do not, do not set the second bait yet. I stand there like this and I watch and I look at that lure and I make sure that the lure is perfor performing perfectly. And some people say to me, well, how do you know if it's swimming right or not? If this is going across the top of the water like this, it's not swimming right, okay? If the rod is bent under load like this, really, really a, a tremendous amount of tension, your lure is swimming right. If that doesn't happen and the lure starts skipping, Stop, don't panic. Don't go, God, these nomads suck. Don't do that. Stop. You can make slight adjustments. Reel it in two feet. Let it out five feet, okay? Adjust it. Sometimes, sometimes, if it's on the front or the back of a wave, a small little adjustment is all that's required to get this thing to swim right. Other times, believe it or not, this, is, this leader's kind of stiff. You put it in the water and you give it a few minutes and it'll soften up and then the lure will swim right. So give it a couple of minutes. Now, and I don't mean 20 minutes, two, okay? Get it out there, look at it, okay? It's under load, it's swimming properly, everything looks good. I'm convinced that that bait is gonna perform perfectly until it gets eaten by a wahoo. It's gonna perform perfectly. My clicker's on. I'm clipped in with the safety tether. You don't want to lose one of these outfits, right? It's really hard to come by tackle nowadays. So that's right. Remember these numbers, 6543. Who can say that with me? 6543. It's that simple. That is the ultimate 
Wahoo spread, 6543. The first one that I set was what? Six. Six. The second one that I set is going to be? Five. five. This is a DTX 165. Slightly larger lip, okay? A little bit of a larger lip. This will swim, and by the way, this DTX 180 will swim right below the surface, maybe two feet, like literally right below the surface. This will swim five to eight feet below the surface, this DTX 165. It's the same size body, but will swim a little bit deeper. And because I'm setting it at number five, how far behind the boat is this? Don't mess this up. How far behind the boat is this? Wrong. 280. 280. You guys didn't know you were coming to a math class, right? You're like, I didn't sign up for this. Okay. 280. 50 feet closer. So now I have two baits out. And again, I do exactly the same thing. I look at it. I study it. Now I have two baits out. 330 feet, two feet below the surface. 280 feet, 50 feet closer to me, and five to eight feet below the surface. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Remember, stop looking at your trolling spread like this and look at it like this. Okay. Look at it, take a, take a, a side view. Don't take just the top view. Combine the top view and the side view. The third bait I'm going to set is a DTX 200. Larger, big lip. By the way, they love the pink. How many bait fish have you seen that are that color? <laughs> Anyhow, this will swim, and again, I don't care what the box says. Okay, the box says this will swim to 50 feet. Maybe if you attach a 12 ounce sinker and throw it in the water. Okay, I don't think that's going to swim at 50 feet, pulling it at 10 miles an hour. It's not. But it will swim at what I believe, and again, this is just based on my experience, at 15 to 18 feet. And I'm going to put this one out. How many numbers? What's the number? Four. 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 We've got six, five, four. Okay, very easy. Six, five, four. And where does this put this? 230. 230. I love you guys. You're picking up on this. 230, right? So this is now swimming deeper and 50 feet closer to the boat. And once again, I spend a minute, I study it, I look at it, I make sure everything is swimming perfectly, okay? Before I set my fourth and final bait, which accounts for 84% of the strikes. 84% of the bites come on the shortest, deepest bait. Three, how far does that put this back? 180. And this is a DTX 220. It's the largest size that they make, and it will swim approximately five to eight feet deeper than the 200. And once again, I sit there and study it, make sure everything is perfect. Okay. I now have four lures out. And listen, I said this accounts for 84% of the bites. These two account for over 90% combined. Unlike tuna that like feathers and lures way back, wahoo do not. Wahoo like the white water. Wahoo are attracted to the white water. That's their playing field right here. Right here, back there. That's where it all happens. That's where the magic happens, baby. Right there, not way out there. So those baits that are way out there don't get hit anywhere near as much as these baits right here that are closer and deepest, okay? By fishing this spread, I'm now doing multiple things. I've got four lures out that are staggered. They're staggered in distance behind the boat. They're also staggered in depth going from three feet, five to eight feet, 12 to 15 feet, and 15 to 20 feet. So I'm covering a lot of the water column, different distances behind the boat, different colors, but also different size baits. Because some days the Wahoo may be keyed in on flying fish that are this big. Other days they may be feeding on the big bonita. I don't know that. So I want to give them a little bit of everything. 
right, to see what they hit. And it's interesting on, you know, some days, like I said, you will get hit on those long baits, but usually it's the shorter ones. But it's always a good idea to have the variety. And if you say, well, wait a minute, if you're saying these largest baits that are closest to the boat get hit the most, why not fish them all big and close to the boat? If you do that, you are never going to catch a wahoo because you're just going to be untangling lures all day long. Okay, that's why we stagger them in distance and in depth and in size to avoid tangles. That, I mean, that's one of the reasons, to avoid tangles. And if you do it right, one step at a time, bingo. That is the wahoo spread right there. And while it may seem simple, you know, it took hundreds of hours, no, thousands of hours, hundreds of trips to dial it all in perfectly between all of the little details to where now I can take this group of four anglers, say we're going wahoo fishing tomorrow, and I can go set it at six, five, four, three. You can stand in that corner and let out six, and once you're 50 feet out, the next guy can let it out. And once you're 50, the next guy. You understand? Because we're not passing each other. So technically, we could essentially set an entire Wahoo spread in 60 seconds. You tell me how you can do that with heavy trolling leads and all of those other components. You can't, it's impossible. Here we can do it in seconds. And there are people in this room who have fished with me who will stand up and tell you that's exactly, that's right. That's how fast it is, okay, because it's a system. I don't go out the next day and go, you know what, shit, let's try seven, five and a half, three and a quarter, and let's try mixing up the sizes, and then go out the next day and go, you know, I didn't get any bites, so let's go nine and seven. No, this is my Wahoo spread, six, five, four, three. You come fishing with me on a Wahoo, you don't even have to come fishing with me and pay me. I just taught you. I just taught you exactly what to do on how to set my first of two Wahoo spreads, okay? Now that we're trolling, 10 miles an hour, everything is swimming perfectly. If it were in calm seas, I don't need to do anything. Every now and then I'll walk back to the cockpit and you'll see me all day doing this, you know, checking the drag all day, just because I have this fear that drags have a way of adjusting themselves. And the last thing I wanna do is lose a fish over something that could have been avoided. So every 10 minutes or so, I'm back there, toot, 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 just double checking the drag, maybe making a fine tune adjustment. Certainly when conditions change, when we make a U-turn and go in the opposite direction, absolutely I'm readjusting the drags. Absolutely, because the conditions are different. The speed may have changed, faster, slower, more pressure on the lures, whatever it is. And any time anyone who fishes with me ever touches one of my rods, I'm then kind of sneaking up behind them. Hey, good, oh yeah, per oh, perfect, yeah. Okay. And I'll point out if they did too much or too little, because again, we want to teach people. So stay on top of it. It's not set it and forget it. Now. We're trolling along, pow, you get pop, you get, you know, you get a fish on. I promise you if the rod does this, if it's bouncing up and down and line is screaming off the reel, you have hooked a wahoo. <laughs> I promise you that. He grabbed it, he's hooked, he's not coming off because he's VMC 8700 uh, southern tuna hooks are deadly. He's not coming off, okay, for the most part. He's shaking his head like this, that's what that rod tip is bouncing. He's shaking his head, trying to get that out of his face, okay? It's a wahoo. Easily, easily, well over 90% of the bites that we, if you get a bite on a DTX minnow, well over 90% it's a wahoo. The only bycatch that we catch, every now and then I'll pick off a blackfin tuna, okay? Believe it or not, a blackfin tuna. I never catch any sailfish, never catch kingfish, never catch barracudas. I don't catch shit but wahoo on these, okay? Which is great for me because I'm wahoo fishing. That's all I want to catch. I don't want to buy catch. It's a big bait moving fast. A small little three pound king mackerel, I don't know. I'm not saying you can't catch it and eat it, but they don't. There's just very little bycatch, very little, which is great. If you get one of these, 
you know, line's just eh, 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 a little bit off the reel. Guess what? Grass. That's not a wahoo. Okay, that's not a wahoo. There's no mistaking a wahoo bite. Okay, it is screaming. The reel is screaming. I'm trolling along. The reel starts screaming, and of course, everybody immediately does this. They all go running to the rod, right? Immediately, instinctively. Don't touch the rod. Wait, wait. Immediately, my hand is on the throttle. Lines peeling off the reel, it's screaming. Wait, wait. I'm not afraid of running out of line. I don't use backing. Does somebody want to guess how many yards of 65 pound braid are on a Shimano Tiagra 30 wide, an LRS, a long range special with the big spool? 500, 600, 600, 600. <laughs> a lot, a lot, okay? I don't know what the number is, but I promise you, it is so much that there is not a Wahoo swimming in the ocean that could spool you. There's not. It's filled from top to bottom with 65 pound braid. No backing. There is thousands and thousands of yards of line, okay, on that reel. Well over a mile of line. I'm not gonna keep trolling and let them dump me. I'm just going because oftentimes you'll get a second fish on. Wahoo are not a schooling fish like dolphin, but Wahoo will swim in schools. Wahoo will, will swim in loosely knit schools of up to 100 fish, sometimes even more. If the scenario is right and they're migrating or moving, it is not uncommon for there to be a big pack of fish. But there may also just be one. There might just be one. I don't know that. I can tell you I didn't just read a giant school on my machine. But if they were over there or over there or over there, I don't know. All I know is I got one on and I'm trying to get a second one on. So I keep going for about five to eight seconds. If we don't get a second one on, then immediately I pull back the throttles into idle. The boat, I mean into not neutral. I do not put the boat in neutral. I'm in idle. That's it. I slow way down. Rod comes out of the holder. Fight him. Fight him. Stand up and fight them, okay? Right under your arm. If you need a rod belt or whatever, fight them, okay? Now, we keep the boat moving forward slowly for two reasons. One, it keeps all the other lures straight behind the boat because if we stop the boat and there's a knot and a half of current pushing us this way and you're fighting a fish in the back, what you don't realize is the boat is drifting back over top of the line and the lures gigantic mess and a nightmare. So you got to keep the boat moving forward. That's one reason. Number two, those lures are still wobbling. So there have been multiple occasions where we're reeling in one fish and boom, another rod goes off and you double up. Okay. And finally three, it's because the guy on the rod can't reel anymore because his shoulder hurts. And he's like, oh my God, I can't do it. Mike, I can't do it. Okay, you can do it, dude. I can't do it. So to keep, make sure there's no slack in the line whatsoever, no slack, we keep that boat moving forward because we don't want them to shake that out of their mouth. And it's a big bait. And they, they're notorious. Wahoo are notorious for shaking lures out of their mouths. So there are multiple reasons to keep everything moving forward. Now follow me. Boat, boat never stops. It never stops. The fish comes up alongside. You walk up, I gaff them, throw the fish in the boat, we're all high five and I'm screaming like a little girl, and the very first thing that I do is go back up to the wheel and push the throttle forward because I still have three baits out, okay? The three baits are right there. We'll take pictures and we'll worry about the fish in a minute. Push the throttles up, start fishing again, immediately, as quickly as possible, start fishing again. And understand, I try not to reel anything in when we're hooked up, unless I have to. You hook a Wahoo, line is screaming off the reel, you pull back the throttles, I don't care who you are, I'm telling you this is what happens, period. You pull back the throttle, you're fighting that fish straight off the back of the boat. He's coming at you. He's coming right at you, okay? He's not over there, he's not over there. He's right there, straight behind the boat. You're reeling, 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 until the fish is right there. And when he's right there, now is when he goes ape shit. And he goes out there, or he goes out there. That's okay. All of the other lures are still behind him. They're behind him back there, so he doesn't tangle anything. So we don't reel anything up unless 
we feel like he might get tangled. You know, if he hits the long bait, now he has to come by three other lures. There's a, there is a chance where you might get tangled if he's got to come by three other lures. So every scenario is different, but we try not to reel in anything else. Like I said, the boat never stops. Now, one more thing I want to mention real quick and talk about, and then we'll wrap this up. Otherwise, I'll sit up here until next Thursday. Up until recently, I'd wahoo fish until 10 a.m., okay, 10 a.m. And if I didn't get bit, or if I did, I either had a successful trip or it was not successful. And in my eyes, even when it, we don't catch fish, it's still a success. I went out there, I set the spread, which that's half the battle. Trust me when I tell you. Catching the fish is the easy part. Doing what I just did and getting it all dialed in, that's the hard part. And while I may make it seem like it's easy or look like it's easy, it is not. And it will not be easy for you. You will get frustrated until you get dialed in. Where do I put this rod? You know, all of the even more details, because everybody's boat's different. You don't have the same rod holder configuration that I have on my CV. You know, unless you have a 39 CV, just like mine, you know, you generally will have your own unique setup. You're going to have your own unique rods and your own unique, you know, everything. So it's going to take you a little time to get dialed in. But anyhow, I would always wahoo fish until about 10 o'clock. And even if we didn't catch anything, I always learn, you know, why didn't we get bit? Why? What went wrong? What what was different today versus yesterday or, you know, anything like that. It's always a learning experience. And then, like I said, by 10 o'clock, I used to throw in the towel. However, one day I said to myself, you know, I really wish I could troll faster, faster. Because Wahoo are capable of, of bursts of speed up to 45 miles an hour. That's why guys high-speed troll for him with the LPs or even without the LPs. You know, we high-speed troll at 15 to 18 miles an hour. That's really, really fast. Well, there's an advantage to trolling that fast. Anybody? Right, you're covering more ground, right? So I always said to myself, well, if I fish till, let's just say, 9, if I started trolling at 7, and if I just went out for a quick morning of Wahoo fishing, in two hours I covered best case scenario 20 miles. Best case scenario, 20 miles. Now, if I had any grass, if I caught a fish or two or three, if I changed lures, any reason that I have to stop the boat or redo or slow the boat down takes miles off. So I'm saying best case scenario 20 miles. So I said, man, I really would like to go faster. But when I push the throttles up, these lures pop out of the water, and they just don't swim right. Well, Nomad makes another lure called a Mad Mac, okay, a Mad Mac. It does not have a lip at all, has a completely different shape. It is a completely different lure altogether. It's not hollow, well, maybe it is, but it's certainly made out of a completely different material. It's eight ounces, it's heavy. Okay. It has a different anchor point. It doesn't connect in the front here on the lip because there is no lip. It connects here on the top, very close, you know, right to the head of the lure, which number one is why it's rigged on cable. Okay, 175 pound test, multi-strand cable. Very short length approximately the same length as the mono, 30 inches, okay, crimped very cleanly with that same loop that we talked about earlier. We're giving it plenty of freedom and then crimped on this side to a little barrel swivel, okay. Everything is rigged, like I said, very similar to the DTXs except for we went for cable. Why? You will get bit off on these because when they do grab it, the hook, as I mentioned, the connection point is not up here, it's right here. In addition to that, this lure, we used to fish a year ago, if I was up here, I would tell you that during our 10 mile an hour spread, this bait would be this bait, would be the number six far out there, would be our furthest bait. But it never got bit, it never got bit, and I could never understand why. Well, that's because this lure, is not designed to swim at 10 miles an hour. It's designed to swim at 15 miles an hour. And I went, voila, 
That's what I need to do, is I need to switch my spread altogether. So now, we have a second set of rods, okay? So we have two sets. We have one set with the DTX minnows, and then we switch to a different set. Slightly lighter, 50 to 100 pound, instead of 60 to 130. These are 50 to 100 pound. Matched to a Shimano Tiagra 20. This essentially is the exact same reel as this. The only difference is the size of the spool. You can see the diameter. If you look, they're the same. The only difference is the size of the spool. Well, this reel is also filled from the top to bottom with 65 pound braid. So that's still plenty of line. Even a 70 pound Wahoo is not gonna pull drag like a 70 pound yellowfin. They just don't have that stamina. Once that first run is over, they've got a few more runs in them, but it's not like a big yellowfin. You don't need thousands and thousands of yards of line. That's overkill. So there's plenty, plenty of line. And once we hook a fish on this, can you grab that? Could you hold that yeah. and reel a fish in on that? Incredibly light. If I took a heavy 50 wide or an 80 and put it in her hand, she couldn't even hold it. Okay, so it's an even lighter rod. Makes fighting Wahoo incredibly sporty. Really, really fun. Okay, fun? Well, hell yeah. Hell yeah, he says, okay. So very, very fun, real sporty. And because we're pulling these, these, they create much less drag in the water than a lip plug. This small one, even with this lip, creates a lot more drag than this Mad Max. So we fish four of these. But because we're fishing four of the identical lure, we lose the advantage of fishing them in different depths, right? Because they're all identical. So no matter where I put them behind the boat, they're all going to swim at the same depth, which is right below the surface. How do we alleviate tangles? We do the same numbers, six, five, four, three. The first one goes out at six, but now what we do, once this is out at the sixth position, this rod goes up here, up in the hard top, way up high, right up there, okay? And the angle of the line is now higher than all of these, and it's impossible. Physically, mechanically, fundamentally, basically impossible for this to tangle with any of the other lures. They're all swimming at the same depth, but the angle of the line coming up to the boat is higher than all of the other ones. It's the furthest one back and highest. Then we will set our second one, and we'll put it right here, okay? Right here in the leaning post. And then we'll set our third one in the back corner and our fourth one in the back corner. The advantage to this spread is we're trolling now at 15 miles an hour. And everyone that ever fishes with me, when we switch gears to this second spread, and I push that boat up to 15 miles an hour, they all look at me like I'm smoking crack or something. They're like, there ain't no way in the world that you're going to catch a Wahoo moving this fast. Oh, yeah? Sit down, OK, and just wait. It's an incredibly effective trolling spread that now allows me to cover 15 miles in another hour. So if I only have one more hour to fish, if I caught fish on the plugs, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep fishing the plugs, right? I mean, don't, don't break something that is, I mean, don't fix something that isn't broken. If you're getting bit on the plugs on that particular day, keep fishing the plugs. If you're not, and this happens, I cannot tell you how many times we don't get bit on the plugs, and now I switch. And I go to the, high, I call it the high speed spread from 10 to 15, whack, and we get bit. Same depth, same area, same everything, but you're going 50% faster. And I believe what's happening, when you're going 10 miles an hour, that Wahoo has a lot of time to inspect that lure. Okay, he swims up to it, he looks at it like we talked about earlier. He has a lot of time to make a decision. 
when you're going 15 miles an hour. And even though it doesn't seem like a big difference, out on the water, it's a big difference. This is now racing by them, racing by them, like super, super fast. Right under the surface in the white water, he has to make a split second decision. Split second. And oftentimes that triggers an instinctive strike when this will not. So it's happened to me on multiple occasions when I didn't get bit on here and then I switch it up and I get bit on here, okay? But this too, very much like the deep diving, the DTX spread, this too is all about the details. Making sure they're in the right positions, making sure the rods are in the right positions. The nice thing about these, about these Mad Max, it set it and forget it, period. There's no, it's not going this way, it's not going that way, it's not faulty, there's no problem in any way whatsoever. That's a bulletproof lure. You put it in the water, forget it. It's rocket, it, it's just perfect. It never fails, it doesn't jump out of the water, there's nothing wrong with it. So it's a very easy, a much easier spread than this one. But there's also a downside because my fuel burn, okay, while I'm gaining 50% of distance, my fuel burn is cut in half, half. So, or let me rephrase that, double, okay? That's a better way of saying it. When I'm trolling this spread on my particular 39CV, triple 400 Verados, 1.4 miles to the gallon with this spread. At 10 miles an hour, 1.4 miles to the gallon. With this spread at 15 miles an hour, 0 0.07, okay, 0 0.07. If you do the math, which I did, every hour that's $100, $100, $100, $100. So it's not something that you potentially want to do all day long because 10 hours of $100 is an expensive day. But I highly recommend that if you're going to be as dedicated about wahoo fishing as I am, incorporate this other spreader, at least try it, you know? And it doesn't have to be with four lures, it could be with two. It could be with two, you could just put two back there. And the same thing, the ones that are closest to the boat, you've got all of this white water, when you're doing 15 miles an hour, you've got a lot of white water. Almost a rooster tail, there's white water everywhere. The two close baits, they're right in this clean avenue, right alongside the white water. And as the boat does this, the lures are swimming in and out of the white water. They get hit far more than the far baits. The far baits get hit, there's no question. But every time one of the far ones does, it surprises me. I'm like, man, I, you know, it surprises me because again, the closest ones tend to get hit the most. So while there are many, many ways to wahoo fish, while there are many areas, many boats, whatever, like I said, I wanted to share with everybody exactly, precisely how I wahoo fish, what my evolution of wahoo fishing has come to. And I can tell you, I catch a lot. I don't catch them every time, but I've got a pretty damn good success ratio. And I'm certain that if you dedicate as much time, effort, and energy as I do into Wahoo fishing, you're gonna be just as successful. And remember, there's no substitution for time on the water, right? You can't catch them sitting on the couch, I can promise you that. You've gotta dedicate yourself and say, I'm gonna go Wahoo fishing, okay? I'm gonna do it. Forget bringing the other stuff, because it's too easy to switch. Don't let simple little things make you lose fish. Your drag's too tight, your knot is not right, your braid is frayed, okay? All of these little things that can cause angler or tackle failure will enter the equation when you're wahoo fishing. And unfortunately, when you're wahoo fishing, when you get a bite, zing pow, and you lose a fish, either because something broke or whatever, you don't know how big that fish was. And for all you know, that was the fish of a lifetime, because I know. I'm only gonna get a shot at a 100 pound Wahoo once. Once in my life will I get a shot at a 100 pounder. I'm hoping it hasn't happened yet. And that wasn't one of the fish that I at some point missed, okay? But of course, I don't know that. So with that being said, again, I appreciate everybody coming here. I hope that you picked up a couple of tips that are gonna help you be a better Wahoo fisherman and a better fisherman in general. And if you did, please, 
Like I said, join our streaming channel at fsftv.com. There's a ton of videos on there. You can see this in action. You can see it out on the boat. You can see me setting the lures. You can see us catching fish. If you have you know, additional questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Okay, I'd be happy to help you. I want you to be a more successful angler. The more Wahoo you catch, the more of my shows you're watching, and the more products from my partners you're buying. That's what it boils down to. So I want you to be as successful as possible. So once again, guys, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming. We're going to do a quick uh, raffle.